former county clerk of Dane County, the former mayor of Madison, and the former home secretary to Representative Kastenmeyer. Mr. Festi re retired a week ago at a marvelous big dinner in his honor, which several hundred people paid tribute for him to him for his uh, his public career. This, I want to leave this microphone where where you, we both can use it, but okay, mostly we'll we'll, stop yeah, it's mostly for you. Okay. And uh, I'm going to start by asking you: uh, You're a native of Dane County, I gather. Yes, I was born in Cross Plains Township on the farm where my parents lived at that time, and the farm that was in the Fesky family a uh, hundred years in 1987, and still is in the Fesky family because my cousin bought it from us in 1985. So. There, now we can start. Now, tell us more about your educational background and your background in Cross Plains. I assume you went to the public schools of Cross Plains? Yes, uh, not far, about half a mile from our farm there was a little country school, Union Valley School, uh, one room school with uh, all eight grades, including kindergarten also, so it would be nine grades, mm -hmm. uh, where I went to school up until uh, 1934 when I graduated from eighth grade and went to Black Earth High School. Black Earth has since become Wisconsin Heights yes. and the little country school that I went to has been removed and is no longer there either. Do you think back fondly on the little country school? Yes, I would say uh, I, I thought it was a good education, you know. We've tried various things over the years and uh, one way or another to improve education but the one thing that I felt was very valuable, uh, you always had two classes together, third and fourth, fifth mm -hmm. and sixth, seventh and eighth, and when you were in third and fourth grade, you were listening to the fifth and sixth graders reciting, and when you were in fifth and sixth, you listened to the seventh and eighth, so you kind of got a pre-education mm -hmm. that by the time you took those subjects, uh, you had some background yeah. in them, and it, uh, they didn't seem so foreign. Uh, I don't think uh, I ever felt that I was handicapped because I didn't attend a school where there were 30 or 40 people in uh, one grade. Uh, I don't think you could really do that successfully today because uh, education was a lot simpler at that That's time. Right. There's too much equipment needed and investment required now. Yes, and the world really has changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. The progress that's been made in that time is just fantastic. and. I'm satisfied the progress that will be made in the, uh, the ensuing years for the same period of time will be something that we couldn't even dream of. If I remember correctly, you were very much interested in music. You were a music major in the university? Yes, I majored in violin at the university uh, starting in 1938 to 42. Uh, prior to that time, I started taking violin lessons from Marie Andres. Matter of fact, I was, there were two predecessors to her who came out to Black Earth, uh, a Miss Salmon and a Fridora Soldan. Some people here in Madison certainly will recall Reverend Soldan, who was a minister at uh, Luther Memorial Church at the time that it was built back in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And uh, so his daughter, uh, a violinist, came out to teach violin. Was and there a, an orchestra at Black Earth? High school? Not at Black Earth. Actually, uh, the only music at Black Earth uh, at the time was uh, a person, uh, a uh, Mr. Lloyd, who came there as a WPA or you know, music mm -hmm. teacher. This was one of the welfare programs, if you want mm -hmm. to call it that, during the uh, Roosevelt administration. One of the wonderful things that. Uh, yes. Uh, other than that, there really wouldn't have been any music. Mm -hmm. But he and a Mr. Charlson were the two people who came out. We had a, a chorus, a mixed chorus, and uh, we also had a band, which he started. I had, of course, started taking uh, cornet lessons before that, and in Cross Plains we had a community band. So uh, for a number of years, uh, I was quite busy playing at picnics uh, in that in area. Music, yeah. 
What, uh, what took you in there? You, you didn't you didn't have brothers and sisters. You didn't have uh, other musicians in the family. Were your parents musical? What I don't just you? remember who it was. It may have, who it was who I heard play the violin, and uh, this uh, it kind of interested me. And of course, my parents were both very interested in providing a musical education uh, for me. And that, I suppose, was the inspiration where they then said, okay, if you want to start the violin, good. This was, of course, during the Depression, and if I remember correctly, we paid 25 cents a lesson for a mm -hmm. half-hour lesson. And uh, when I took lessons from Marie Andres and at that time, it was at the Wisconsin School of Music, which then was located upstairs in the building that was at the intersection of Gorham and Gilman and State Street. Uh, this was later, and may at that time have been Wolf Kubli and Hersig's uh, hardware store. Mm -hmm. Now, but mm -hmm. uh, now they sell military uniforms and stuff. Now right? it is gone entirely. Oh, it's gone. Uh, the building is gone. There was a fire a number of years oh, ago, yes, and the building is gone. But uh, next to that building lived the Hausman family, who had been, uh, who had the Hausman Brewery here in Madison in prior years, I guess prior to Prohibition, when there was Farbach Houseman and a third brewery, and I don't recall that one. At any rate, uh, my mother always raised chickens, and uh, so uh, as a way of paying for the trip to Madison and the violin lessons, she uh, had customers where she delivered deliver eggs, and the Houseman's, as I recall, were one of those families. Also during that time, my father knew a number of people and uh, in Madison, and on the way home, would mention that he had uh, run into so and so today. And again, I say this was during the Depression when people were looking for work. And he'd mm -hmm. comment, "Yes, I saw so and so today, and it's been so long. He's been trying to get a job and hasn't had anything. And how fortunate we are that we're living on the farm. We have our own vegetables. We have our own meat uh, and milk and." Uh, I know my mother always had a large vegetable garden and strawberries and, and cherries, various fruit trees. I remember the uh, cranberries particularly because uh, they had to be picked along in the summertime when it was very hot and the darn things were always full of mosquitoes. Yeah. So oh. it was a challenge whether it was worth picking the cranberries to be eaten up by the mosquitoes. You had a very advantaged bringing up, didn't you? Yes, I would say so. And uh, You're not a poor kid that made a, made good. You were... Uh, well, it was great that I did have parents. those opportunities and the fact that we were on the farm. I know there were mm -hmm. other neighbors who uh, lost their farms at that time. But, and one neighbor in particular I remember who had a beautiful herd of purebred Ayrshire cattle and apparently was overextended as is happening in recent years now that Farmers are overextended, losing their farm, losing their herds. So uh, we were very fortunate that uh, we had the main staples. And I know uh, when I would go to the store for my mother, it would be uh, sugar and flour, butter, and uh, maybe a few other things, baking soda, whatever she needed for baking. Salt. Salt, yes, oh, salt and pepper you had to have. But, but everything else you had in the had We home. didn't expect to go to the store in the winter time and buy fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother always bought uh, peaches and pears in the summertime and canned those. So many of the things that we needed were in the basement in the winter time. Mm -hmm. And it was canned uh, meat as well. My dad uh, always smoked the hams and the shoulders and made mm -hmm. uh, good old German sausage. Uh, so we had sausage to eat and. Uh, we had a nice big uh, smokehouse uh, where he smoked these things. We didn't have refrigeration. There was an old house next to our house with a basement that was nice and cool in the summertime. Uh, that was the refrigerator. That was mm -hmm. where we could put things and uh, keep them for a little longer than you could otherwise because, uh, well, we didn't, there was no such thing as refrigeration. So you had a, a sort of a uh, enriched life which included all the various things you had to do to, to support yourself. Yes. You had to smoke the meat and can the fruit and oh, sure. make the jelly, yeah. drip the grapes down through the, those sacks that we used to use. I must say we were fortunate in that uh, we did have electricity. You had uh, it before it was 
Well, when, Common? when my father built the house in 1915, uh, they had just started the Cross Plains Electric Company, and he was one of the early shareholders, so the neighbors up and down the road had also participated, and they extended the electric line down past our place, so we had electricity. Your parents were then uh, natives of Cross Plains, too? Yes, know? my father was born in a house, of, I would say, if you drive on Main Street in Cross Plains, about the center of town. And uh, my mother was born in the town of Barrie on a farm, mm -hmm. so they were natives of that area. And everybody, you had lots of relatives around too, I suppose. Well, it wasn't a big relationship up until oh, a few years ago. We weren't aware of the fact yeah. that there were any other fescues any place but out there. And one time while I was county clerk on a trip to Milwaukee, I happened to look in the telephone directory and found there were some fescues there. It's possible that if we trace our relationship back far enough that we could be related. And you got mixed but, up with all those dim dogs, though. There are a lot of them. Well, yes. My wife's family, there were nine children. And that was a good-sized yeah. family. And uh, they were natives of the Black Earth, really the Vermont Valley between Black Earth and Mount Horb. Uh, Evie and I went to school together at uh, Black Earth. Uh, she uh, graduated in 1939, I graduated in 38, so she's celebrating her 50th anniversary you this year. It. When you look back, you don't think, my goodness, has it been 50 years? Yeah. It really doesn't seem Everybody that long looks ago. about the same. Yeah. Your high school education in Black Earth must have prepared you well for the university. I don't suppose many kids went to the university in those days. From Black Earth? No, I would say that uh, it was a privilege at that time for someone graduating from high school to go on to university. Uh, some of the uh, women, of course, graduating perhaps went to uh, uh, Whitewater or one of the other what they called normal schools at yeah. that time to, uh, to teach. for a two year period uh, to become teachers. Uh, also interesting is that Black Earth uh, will be uh, celebrating its 100th anniversary in 1991. So, uh, so they'll have a big reunion of the school, I yeah, suppose. That, as I recall, was the first graduating class in, 19, or in 1891, so we're looking forward to uh, a special commemoration of the Black Earth Alumni Association mm -hmm. at that time. Um, also, while I was in high school, I uh, attended the music clinic at the university here. And uh, when I graduated from high school, I uh, was fortunate enough to obtain a music clinic scholarship, Wonderful. which paid for tuition, mm -hmm. which at that time, as I recall, was the horrendous price of 30 or $32 yeah. per semester. 37 because of the tops, I think. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was very, very reasonable, and still at all, $32 was a heck of a lot of money. Yeah. I remember uh, having lunch in the old Spanish cafe next to the Orpheum Theater at noon for 35 cents. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could have had it for 25 in the Memorial Union. Probably. And also that uh, during the time that we were in high school, uh, if we had a date, uh, we had a dollar. We went to uh, perhaps the Majestic Theater because that was 15 cents a person, so that was mm -hmm. 30 cents. And we'd go to uh, Coney Island on State Street where you could get a, a hot dog and a hamburger and a Coke for a nickel apiece. And uh, well, with that, maybe you might have some money left over at the end of the mm -hmm. evening. Uh, we didn't travel the distances that people do today because uh, an evening going to Madison to the movie was really a big night yeah, out. Yeah, it sure was. And once a year, of course, we had the prom in Black Earth, and that was really the big night. But we didn't spend the money that I heard just recently. Somebody who was in the dress business mentioned that she had sold prom dresses to high school girls for $200 and $300 Isn't a piece. Isn't that shocking? Uh, they never wear them again either. Probably never wear them again. Or if they were properly made, maybe you could mm -hmm. remake them yeah. into a dress that you'd wear otherwise. Maybe you could sell it for $5 to somebody. Yeah. Or maybe somebody buy it next year, for example. But uh, those were good days, and uh, 
I, I don't think that we were really uh, disadvantaged to entertainment otherwise uh, in the long about in May or June before we put hay in the barn. If the barns were empty, uh, there'd be a barn dance someplace, mm -hmm. and that was a neighborhood entertainment. Uh, many people, uh, when they had a birthday, a birthday or an anniversary, the neighbors would get together and uh, somebody had an accordion or a fiddle or something, mm -hmm. and they'd take up the rug in the living room or the parlor, whatever they called it in those days, and uh, dance for a couple of hours. Uh, you know, I guess we didn't have beer or anything, because uh, for a while at least that was illegal, but later on, even if it was legal, mm -hmm. uh, that would have been too expensive. But uh, at midnight, of course, we always had coffee and lunch. And lunch and was the elaborate lunch. Oh, yeah, you might as well say ham you had a meal. Ham but, sandwiches. And oh, yes, yeah. But uh, it was uh, a very economical way of having a lot of fun. And uh, again, I say people were not thinking, oh, this is terrible. We can't fly to Paris over the weekend. Yes, Some people yeah. can't do today. Uh, the university, uh, also while I was in high school then, uh, I think this was when I was a sophomore, I uh, joined the Madison Symphony Orchestra. Marie mm -hmm. Andrews was still my teacher, and uh, at that time she started me out as a violist, way in the back of the viola section. My first performance was Handel's Messiah, which was performed in the Orpheum Theater, and uh, was this your, during your college days? Well, this is during high school. High school. Yeah, this would be, let's say, probably 1935. The month of December, the Handel's Messiah, the Orpheum Theater. There was a movie which was over with at 8 o'clock. The curtain went up. The orchestra and chorus and soloists came on stage, and the audience left because, after all, the movie was over with. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were less people in the audience listening to the performance than there were people on stage. I'm using it to point out how we have grown culturally in this no, country to where in recent years you had to get your tickets early in order to get okay. to a performance of Handel's Messiah in Madison. And of course the University of Wisconsin again has been a tremendous influence. We have today if not the finest, one of the finest symphony orchestras for a city of 170,000 anywhere in yes, the country. it is an excellent orchestra. Also, yeah. I would say that uh, at, back in the 30s and early 40s, sure, there was the Chicago, the Philadelphia, the New York, Philharmonic, and so on, but symphony orchestras otherwise uh, just weren't that yeah. prevalent. There weren't that many, there weren't enough musicians in well, the and areas. Also, when I was in high school one time, I went to Milwaukee to hear the Philadelphia Symphony in the old auditorium there. Mm -hmm. And after the performance, uh, the other fellow I went with and I went backstage, and it was really like going to a little United Nations because mm -hmm. everybody was speaking a different language. How many of them really could speak English, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, this music. was because all our musicians came from Europe. Yeah. And the music was an international language. Everybody could learn it. Yes. Uh, today, I would say the person who is a member of a symphony orchestra in this country who is not an American citizen or mm -hmm. hasn't been you know, trained in music in this country is the unusual person. I think most of the Oriental violinists, the Koreans and the Japanese, are trained in America now. Yeah, there are more of them today uh, mm -hmm. that, than there were, but and there still are people who are trained in other countries, but uh, we have grown tremendously uh, musically and otherwise uh, in the, this period of time. So you, after you graduated from the university, you uh, taught music in Blackbird? Actually, I didn't graduate because my father died in 1940. And we had hired men, and my mother was trying to run the farm. I was trying to be of help when I could while I was going to school. And at the end of the first semester of my senior year, I just decided this was something that was above and beyond the call of duty that my mother should try to operate that farm. And the question was, uh, what would we do with it? Would I go home and run the farm? Or would we sell the farm? Or how would uh, things work mm -hmm. out? So. 
we decided that I would uh, leave the university and go back and run the farm, which I did, and in one way or another kept running the farm with tenants uh, or with uh, hired help uh, over a period of years until 1985 when, uh, when we sold it. You were in charge all that time? Yes, even when we had uh, renters, uh, the contract was worked out that we kept the livestock and uh, other things. The tenant furnished the labor and machinery because I wanted to keep a hand in the uh, uh, building of the herd, so that mm -hmm. because we did have a purebred herd, so for that reason, okay, so for that reason, uh, the contract was drafted in the uh, no, I'll just let that go. Okay. Uh, I suppose we could go back to uh, the university where I uh, was fortunate enough to have a music clinic scholarship and uh, did play in the university orchestra. I also played in the university band the first semester of my freshman year. The alternatives were ROTC, uh, uh, band, or... Uh, some type of physical education program since I uh, was able to play the trumpet well enough to get into the band I chose that instead and played for football games and so on and then dropped that at the end of the first semester. Interestingly I also played with the Madison Symphony at that time and uh, at the end of the first year dropped the Madison Symphony because then there was a certain amount of hostility between the University Music School and the uh, Madison Symphony. If you played in one, you're, you were almost persona non grata in the other one. Fortunately, all that has changed where today the members of the Pro Arti and other members of the uh, University School of Music are some of the uh, first chair players in the mm -hmm. Madison that's Symphony. Really wonderful. I think that's a, been tremendous progress again. It's wonderful for the students to have yes. exposure to those. Uh, matter of fact, I was concertmaster of the university orchestra the, the last year and a half that I was uh, a student at the university. After that, uh, I then I stayed home in 1944. I went to a town caucus to find out what happened, and I did find out I was nominated to be assessor of the town of Cross Plains. Knowing nothing about it, I then went to the State Department of Taxation for some education. Did and they offer a training course or something? Not a training course, but it was an opportunity to sit down and talk about uh, what needed to be done, how you did it, what resources there were available, and so on. Uh, so I, with all that tremendous knowledge, I became the uh, assessor. It was interesting, the day of the caucus, uh, the assessor was a candidate for the town chairman against the current chairman. When I got down to the office of uh, Assessor, why there were only a few of us around, and somebody said, well, I nominate Otto Feske. I said, uh, no, thank you. I'm not interested. As a matter of fact, I don't know anything about what an Assessor does. Well, one fellow said, you were at the University of Wisconsin? I said, yes, but they didn't teach me anything about real estate values <laughs> in the music school. Having no opposition, I won. Uh -huh. And I was Assessor until 1952 when I chose not to run for re-election. That's, and how, how many years was that? That was eight years I was assessor. Yeah, that's a fair chunk of time. Also during that time, I think it was about 1945 or, or late, it was later than that because it was five years, so by 1947, uh, the old principal at Black Earth uh, asked whether I would come down and uh, teach music at least part-time, which I agreed to do. So I was doing part-time music teaching at Black Earth, part-time okay, assessor, part-time farmer, and I guess I was, that was about it. I was doing everything part-time mm -hmm. and nothing full-time. In 52, I decided that was it. I had to do something full-time, and since we had the farm, that was going to be it. Well, in the... Uh, you were all, already county clerk, weren't you? No, that's, uh, let me back up to 1951. Mm -hmm. Uh, Herman Eisner had been elected uh, assemblyman from Western Dane County in 1950, 1948, re-elected in 1950. Who could forget Herman Eisner? At, in 1950, Irv Bruner ran against uh, Herman as a Democrat, but Herman won. Uh, in 1951, Herman decided he had to go to confession and bear his soul, and he decided that he, on the 
on the floor of the Wisconsin Assembly announced that he was renouncing his Democratic membership and henceforth would be a Republican. I remember. I got his, I was the recipient of his wrath. <laughs> the uh, uh, good people in Western Dane County, particularly in the Cross Plains area, and he decided that I should be the candidate. And one way or another mentioning this, and I always said, well, that's fine, no thank you, I'm not interested. I was planting corn in the spring of 19, the month of May of 1952, and came in for dinner, and my wife said, uh, you've been holding out on me. I said, I have, about what? Well, she said, you're running for the assembly. I said, I'm not running for anything. Where'd you hear that? Oh, in Joe Frank's butcher shop. Mm -hmm. I said, was Biederman the barber there too? She said, yes. Well, I said, you've just been had. They were pulling your leg. I said, I'm not running for anything. And before I was through washing up for a dinner, why, a car drove in, and my wife said, uh, Otto, there's a car drove in. I said, yeah, and that's Bill Dahman with the nominating and nomination papers. Absolutely a joke. And I went out, sure enough, it was Bill, and he had nomination papers. He said, well, now they're filled out, and you can... Uh, take those into Keith Schwartz, the county clerk, and file them, and you're our candidate for the assembly. And I said, well, gee, I said, I had, I had told nobody that you could do this. And, well, he said, you take them in and you can file them. And so Abby and I talked about it, and I said, well, I might as well have some fun. I probably won't make it anyway, but uh, uh, it'd be kind of fun in the summertime. And so I did. I filed the nomination papers and ran for the assembly and lost the primary to Irv Brunner. And the Sunday after the primary, Keith Schwartz announced that he was leaving the county clerk's race and going to uh, Green Bay to accept a job with National Cash Register. I went, then went in and visited with Miles Riley and Marv Smith back, who were Register of Deeds and uh, County Treasurer. And I said, looking over the ticket, it seems there ought to be somebody from Western Dane County. There are people from Eastern Dane, from Madison, but mm -hmm. nobody from Western Dane. And they asked whether, whether I would run. I said, that's not why I'm here. I said, I know of a young person who I think would be a good candidate uh, for a county clerk with his background and everything. But I said, no, thank you. I'm not interested. Well, after a little prodding, they, I said, well, uh, under one condition, and that is if all of the candidates, including Irv Brunner, will agree that uh, I should be the candidate. And if the statutory committee unanimously nominates me, I will do it. This was to replace Keith Schwartz. Yes, on the ticket. Was it, was it going to be a uh, special election? No, this would be the November oh. election in 52. Oh. So, so you had to. The, all of this did take place. and. Uh, but prior to that, uh, while I was thinking, well, everything's going to have to be very hush-hush about this, I listen to the radio at noon, noon news, and I hear that on the radio it says Otto Fiske will be the nominee for county clerk on the Democratic ticket. And I thought, oh my God, who let that out? So I went in and talked to Miles and to uh, Marvin, and after a bit uh, Marvin said, well, I was up on the square buying a paper and I met Bill Evieu and he said, uh, who's going to be the Democratic candidate for county clerk? And I said, well, I don't know, the, the statutory committee nominates him. What about this young fellow Fesky from Cross Plain? And he said, I said, well, if that's all we need to know. And he said, accordingly, Evieu ran the story in, on the radio mm -hmm. and in the newspaper. Uh, again, it was an interesting campaign and uh, Campaigning is interesting. We isn't it? did spend the horrendous sum of five hundred dollars, which at that time was a lot of money. Today, yes, it it probably would buy one spot on a television station, mm -hmm. if that. But uh, on election night, I was in the courthouse, and uh, Keith Schwartz, who was the county clerk, came out of his office. And uh, at that point, I was running behind and. Fully expected to lose. Keith came out and said, let me congratulate you. You're going to win. You're going to win by around 900 votes. I said, how can you say that? I'm running way behind. Mm -hmm. Well, he mentioned Monona and a number of places that Key were still places, out yeah. and, and uh, their Democratic awards and you'll win. And uh, so uh, I went up to the Park Hotel where the Democrats were celebrating, went back to the courthouse. Uh, get a final reading, and when I got there, I had won, I think, 980 votes and continued so, to win. A whole new uh, life started for you. I should say a whole new life. The county board uh, 
then appointed me for the month of December because Schwartz resigned as of the end of so November. So you started the very next day. And I started the next day <laughs> as uh, county clerk of Dane County, knowing absolutely nothing about the office except that my wife and I had applied for a marriage license, mm -hmm. and a Mrs. Weaver was the marriage license clerk at that point. Uh, she later went to the Register of Deeds office, and uh, I uh, had perhaps bought a hunting license or a fishing license that had the county clerk's name on it. Other than that, I really didn't know an awful lot about the county clerk's office. Mm -hmm. And in 1965, uh, or 64, uh, people persuaded me that I should be a candidate for mayor. And on a nice cold day in December, I announced that I was going to be a candidate, opening up my remarks by saying, people have said that it will be a cold day when Otto Feske announces for mayor. And it and was. It, uh, it was. I was fortunate. I was elected in 65 in April. Well, so and your county clerk days were how, how many years? Did well, let's say th roughly 13 years. 13 years yeah. then. I think it's important to realize that we didn't have a county executive in those days. And I'm just repeating myself briefly. It, too, it was as close to a county executive as we had in those days. And you, with the chairman of the county board, had an enormous influence on the county. Yeah, I would say throughout Wisconsin, there were two people, one of two people, who would be perhaps comparable to a county executive, either the county board chairman or the county clerk. And uh, Wood County, for example, Joe Schindler, there's no question he was the person who was running Wood County. Uh, in uh, Kenosha, Dick Lindgren, again, was a county clerk who uh, um, really made the office into a very important office in the county by uh, accepting various responsibilities which the county board would give him over that period of time. Uh, I would say in Dane County, I had the opportunity of working with the 90-member county board, and uh, I was very pleased to have the opportunity over the years to have worked with the board and its committees in so establishing a county library system, mm -hmm. and uh, working with the county board and establishing uh, bringing about the uh, Dane County Memorial Coliseum. Uh, we revised the juvenile court system, I remember. Well, were yeah, also, well, it was basically the family code mm -hmm. that was revised, and I had the opportunity to work with uh, the legislature and uh, with the county clerks and district attorneys and so on in, in drafting that, uh, that bill. I can remember in those days that I taught out in the village of Oregon and the mm -hmm. students in the high school didn't barely knew that Eisenhower was president and they didn't know uh, who was the mayor or the governor but they all knew Otto Feske that was a word that just tripped off their tongues because of your because of the hunting licenses and the fishing licenses and the yeah. ID cards that they carried yeah I think you know either they had the hunting and fishing license or their father probably mm -hmm. uh, or mother had a had a license to hunt or fish and uh, so the name was uh, identified, and also, uh, again, because of the fact that the county board was large and there was no full-time executive, the news media would come to the county clerk's office for information. Mm -hmm. And in that way, I had it the had opportunity to get some yeah. publicity. It was rather interesting, uh, the State Journal especially, uh, being a Republican newspaper, uh, when it was an election year, would uh, uh, attribute my statements to well-known courthouse sources. Mm -hmm. and they couldn't possibly use my name. Uh, where during the off year, why they they would probably mention it was County Clerk Otto Feske. The Cap Times, of course, did not have those inhibitions and mm -hmm. gave me an opportunity mm -hmm. to get me a little publicity that way. It was interesting, like, when Keith Schwartz left the office, he said, now one thing I want to tell you, the best way you can get publicity is to hold up a check once in a while. Don't mm -hmm. pay something and, uh, and the news media will pick it up and uh, you'll sound like you're a very conservative, <laughs> uh, fiscally conservative county mm -hmm. clerk. I didn't do it intentionally, but there were times when there were legitimate reasons for holding up a check and, mm -hmm. again, a way of getting uh, some recognition for the mm -hmm. operation of county government. Mm -hmm. Well, that, uh, and of course, there was a ridiculous county board, 80 
four members or whatever it was. Finally, 90 before they were, mm -hmm. because I think in the early years, Sun Prairie was a village, became a city, and uh, uh, I don't remember whether uh, Monona became a city before I left the county clerk's office. Sun Prairie. Uh, the change about, uh, the change of the county board came about because, as you will recall, two reporters from the Milwaukee Sentinel raised the legal question of whether there was equal representation on county boards, took the matter all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held that no, it was not a matter of one vote, one, yeah. one person, one vote, because the uh, board was established on the basis of every town chairman being a member of the county board, every village having a representative, and every city ward. And it's fortunate we didn't have more cities in Dane County or we'd have gone over the hundred. Yeah. I believe the largest county board at that time was Wayne County, Detroit, Michigan, where they did have over a hundred members on the county board. But, you know, everybody said, well, it's an unwieldy board to deal with, and really it wasn't because there was a built-in leadership. Uh, people on the board respected the committee action generally. Mm -hmm. And uh, my complaint here all along was that why doesn't the chairman of the committee have an opportunity first to get up and explain why the committee took the action they did or what the basic uh, concept of the resolution or ordinance was and why the action was taken and then let other people speak frequently. The opposition was on the floor first and uh, uh, trying to defeat something before anybody had an opportunity to say, well, why did you recommend that we should adopt it, or why did you recommend we should not adopt it? But uh, I guess that's how uh, bodies like I that I remember function. sitting next to Percy Ramish, who was my seatmate. Mm -hmm. He represented the village of Rockdale or something. Dane. And, and he had 113 people in his, mm -hmm. and I had 13,000 in the 13th Ward of Madison. Yeah, good and example. But... Uh, with a change, and I think it came to 42, if I'm not mistaken, yes, so. supervisors. And then you, uh, what, what, what led you to run for mayor? Well, let me back up just one moment okay. again and say, why did this 90-member county board vote to build the Memorial Coliseum? My analysis is simply this. Here we had a group of supervisors who knew they were going to be leaving office because a new group were coming in through reapportionment. Uh, the city of Madison had been struggling for how long to build a civic center and an auditorium? When you realize there were 35 townships and 23 villages, in addition to the city of Madison supervisors, which there were 22, I think what happened, the rural supervisors said, you know, we're going to be out of business, most of us are. We want to leave a memorial mm -hmm. to Dane County, to this old county board. And the Memorial Coliseum was a, it was a memorial to the veterans of Dane County, but to we them it was a it. personal memorial. Well, memorial to the county and the fact that Madison was struggling and struggling and unable to consummate the building of the Monona Terrace, mm -hmm. The farmers, in effect, were saying, let's show these people in Madison what a bunch of farmers can do when we make up our mind to do something. And they did. They did yeah. The last night that I was county clerk, I had been sworn in as mayor in the morning, went to my last county board meeting at night. We awarded the bids for the construction of the Coliseum and the bids for the uh, <coughs> bond issue mm -hmm. to build the Coliseum. And uh, the library, too, I think the, uh, we were not at that point, that, that was earlier, but again, I think the county board at that time, rural supervisors, many of them felt, well, gee, here's an opportunity to do something for our people, give them an advantage they don't have today. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, possibly the, uh, I think at that time already there was a threat that maybe there would be some change in the makeup of the county board. So, getting back to your question that I strayed away from, uh, what motivated me to run for mayor? Well, uh, in uh, 1963, uh, a number, or even in 61, a number of people uh, came to me and said, why don't you run for mayor? 
well, we just moved into Madison in 1960, and I thought, for heaven's sakes, you don't uh, move into Madison in 1960 and run for mayor in 61. Uh, and in 63, I again said, no, I, uh, I'm not interested. I don't think that I've been around here long enough, really. In 65, I finally said, okay, if, I, if people are interested in having me run for mayor, if I'm ever going to do it, I better do it now. People are going to stop asking, and I'll be uh, left out entirely. So I said, okay, I will do it. And I was interested, too, with the, the I think if you will remember, Ruth, the one event that was constantly before us at that time was the construction of an auditorium and civic center. Mm -hmm. During uh, Mayor Reynolds' administration... It's something that won't die. Uh, he... Uh, of course, uh, did actually bring in a Philadelphia lawyer uh, from uh, the name doesn't come to me right offhand, but at any rate, uh, uh, the purpose was to serve as a uh, mediator to uh, bring about a, an end to the Frank Lloyd Wright contract. And the dispute was over the amount of money that was due and owing to uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. Uh, because of the termination of the building of Winona Terrace. And when I came in, I said, before we go to that extent, and uh, let's see if there isn't an opportunity to uh, uh, do this through negotiation. And uh, I appointed a committee consisting of people who were for Monona Terrace, people who were against it, and people who had never been on either side, really, publicly at least and uh, set up a negotiating committee. We were able to uh, uh, bring about a solution with the able assistance of Nate Feinsinger, university's mm -hmm. law professor, who was recognized nationally and perhaps even internationally as an outstanding labor negotiator. Mediator. Mediator. And uh, we did terminate that contract. Immediately, I reappointed a committee to look into the possibility of building something. I thought we needed to get the old contract out of the way because of all the problems that had existed over the years. And thought by using a similar approach as we did with building the Coliseum, by doing a thorough job ex of exploring what are the needs of Madison, uh, what should we, what should this facility provide for as the, using that then as the basis for entering into a contract to, uh, to build an auditorium and civic center. We did that. We entered into a contract with uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation to draft a plan for the development of an area known as Monona Basin, which included everything from Blair Street to the causeway, around the causeway over to Olin Park, and including the Turville property, which we were in the process of buying at that time. Uh, they did divide, bring up the development plan, and immediately, of course, Carol Metzner brought a lawsuit that uh, it was illegal to hire the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation to draft a master plan for Madison. So we lost some more time going through the uh, lawsuit, and finally uh, Judge Wilkie ruled in the city's favor that, yes, we did have the authority to do this, and. Fortunately, Carol didn't take us to the Supreme Court, and, as I suppose he could have done, but I think realizing that he had lost the battle at that point and gave up on it, we then were able to get agreement on the council to proceed with the construction of a building in Law Park which would have provided a large auditorium seating 2,350 people for uh, symphony performances and uh, performances of that kind. Since we didn't feel we had adequate resources to build a theater for the Madison Theater Guild and other theatrical performances, we settled on constructing the building with a drop ceiling so you could reduce the size of the auditorium that it could be used for both. This, of course, increased the cost of the facility. Uh, we had a an agreement from Babe Rohr, who had been a Alderman Rohr, who was a lifelong opponent of Monona Terrace, that if that Wes Peters had agreed that yes, he the first place to get Monona, the ba Monona Basin Plan adopted, he would see that there were structures in Olin Park, which is where Babe wanted the uh, 
uh, auditorium. Uh, interestingly enough, the Olin Park was in the 14th Ward, which he mm -hmm. represented, and uh, some other concessions, uh, as I recall, to a couple of other aldermen. So we got the job done. We The contract for the design of the Monona Basin was perhaps the most was more discussed in greater detail with more questions than any contract the city of Madison ever entered into or ever will enter into. We started a public hearing at 8 o'clock in the evening and basically the person who was on the before the council to answer questions was William Wesley Peters, the architect of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. And uh, they really fly spec that contract every possible way and argued. And finally, at 4 o'clock the next morning, we took the vote and adopted the, uh, the contract, they approved the uh, signing of the contract. I must say that Mr. Peters was perhaps the most patient person that I've ever had the opportunity to deal with in spite of all of the questions many of them that were probably ridiculous, that he dealt with in a very common, straightforward manner, uh, was most impressive. His boss wasn't quite that patient. Well, I understand that Mr. Wright was uh, a different sort of person, uh, and perhaps that was part of the problem, I don't know. But uh, there were people uh, going back to when the, count, the city of Madison in 54 voted favorably on three referendum questions. The one that carried the, with the most number of votes was the $4 million bond issue for mm -hmm. the auditorium and civic center and a million and a half for parking facility. The next one was locating the facility in Law Park and the third one was uh, engaging Frank Lloyd Wright as the architect. Uh, immediately, those who opposed it, uh, basically Henry Reynolds, uh, Joe Jackson, uh, Marshall Brown, Carol Metzner, and others in Madison uh, decided to see that this was not going to happen. They had lawsuits. Uh, there was one questioning whether this was in conflict with the Northwest Ordinance. Uh, Mr. Metzner was then the assemblyman and introduced a bill limiting the height of anything in Law Park to, I'm not sure whether it was 10 or 20 <laughs> feet high, but at any rate, sufficiently low enough that you couldn't possibly build an auditorium and civic center. He was able to get this through the legislature and the then Governor Vernon Thompson signed the bill and I think this was probably the basic yeah, reason yeah. that Carol Metzger lost his assembly seat on the west side of Madison, which at that time was basically Republican, particularly the 20th Ward. Uh, it was perhaps one of the reasons that Gaylord Nelson defeated Carol Metzner uh, statewide not Carol Metzner, <laughs> defeated Vernon Thompson for governor statewide because um, I think people around the state resented this, uh, saying, well, this was going entirely too far. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had the ideal candidate, uh, Dick Cates, a tall Lincoln-esque type of person mm -hmm. who uh, was very sincere, had already established himself as a very fine lawyer in the district attorney's office as the deputy district attorney. Uh, Dick has set out his schedule to go door to door every afternoon, leaving the courthouse at 4.30. And uh, in November, when the votes were counted, Dick was the new assemblyman and uh, Carol Metzner was out. This didn't prevent them, of course, from continuing to work against the uh, auditorium and civic center. Had Ivan Nestigan continued in Madison as mayor, instead of going to Washington with the Kennedy administration in January of 1961, I think that uh, Ivan perhaps might have been able to bring this about. But, he was a very active mayor. Yes, and, and I think was it might have been able to use his influence to uh, persuade Madison to go ahead with it. Uh, but at any rate, when the bids were opened, we had basically five and a half million to work with, and the bids were thirteen and a half million dollars. Obviously, way beyond the money available. Bob Knuckles, who was the candidate for mayor, 
was defeated by Henry Reynolds and of course the immediately uh, Mayor Reynolds started an alternate site and getting rid of the Frank Lloyd Wright contract, which fortunately he was not able to do in four years while he was the mayor. Uh, a very tragic situation for Madison because the original Monona Terrace, the Monona Basin Plan would have been so unique that Madison would have really been an outstanding city, which it is obviously anyway, but it would have been the crown jewel of the United States. Your, your uh, discussion here is, makes it quite clear that the subject is, it still rankles with many people on all sides. The subject of Frank Lloyd Wright and the Monona Terrace plan is still, it never, it's a subject that's never died. It's still in people's minds. Yeah, it's an issue which refuses to die. Mm -hmm. It's interesting now when Madison was uh, discussing the possibility of building a convention center. Uh, the uh, uh, designer of the convention center that was to be built, uh, known as Olin Terrace, mm -hmm. actually uh, was copied from the uh, Monona Terrace plan in that it extended out over the railroad tracks mm -hmm. into the uh, into Law Park. Um, Unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, the plan was not sufficiently developed that the people of Madison could vote for it. Immediately, however, there was a group organized to see if they couldn't persuade City Hall to call in uh, Mr. Peters and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation to see what they could do with Monona Terrace or the Monona Basin uh, project mm -hmm. to build a convention center there. Uh, whether that will ever occur is hard to say. Fortunately, Mayor Soglin uh, today is taking a new look at it. One of the problems with the convention center, I think, was that the developers were the two who were battling over it. Uh, Daryl Wild, who uh, owns the uh, Concourse Hotel, who wanted it built over there next to the concourse and also building another hotel so that uh, the convention center would be an asset to the concourse. And uh, Jerry... Uh, Mullins, who owns the uh, Park Motor Inn, uh, wanted it on his side of the uh, square and started acquiring property uh, with the thought in mind of building on that side. And it was really the battle between two developers rather than the city becoming mm -hmm. involved and saying, okay, let's study where this ought to be, let's select the site, and we'll go on from there. A lot of Which, ordinary citizens couldn't figure out what they were talking about a lot yeah. of the time in that area. I do think Mayor Soglin now uh, will give it a new, fresh approach and will involve the expertise of people in City Hall and come back with a response that uh, perhaps will be more feasible and possible, whether it might be either one of these locations or something entirely different. Now then, after, after all of that, you decided to retire as mayor not run again, and take this quieter job, or what you thought was going to be a quieter job, working for Bob Kastenmeyer? Well, actually, I went with Century Insurance for two and a half years mm -hmm. in between, but uh, during the time that I was mayor, beginning with October of 1967, with the Dow Chemical de riot mm -hmm. demonstration, call it what you want to, on campus, uh, we were into the Vietnam War, we were into the uh, protest movement against the war, and it was a very difficult time. Students, I think very legitimately, were asking the question, why are we being asked to go into war, to risk our lives, to make the supreme sacrifice, when nobody's told us what we're going to accomplish in Vietnam? As mayor, with our meetings, we were saying, well, let's get this darn war over with because then the money that's being spent on the war will be available so we can do all these glorious things for the cities. Uh, the uh, confrontations between the students and police uh, that occurred, obviously, were quite a concern to the mayor and, and how this needed to be handled. We also had a black student demonstration at that point where the black students uh, felt they were not getting a fair deal out of the University of Wisconsin and I'm sure other places as well. We had the National Guard on campus both the, because of the Vietnam situation and because of uh, the uh, black student demonstration. At this time we were trying to build an auditorium at Civic Center. During the uh, last months that I was in office in 69 we had a firefighter strike. And first and only one? 
that was the first and only firefighter strike. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, of course, we had the threats of a street department strike. And uh, on January 1st of 69, I decided uh, I was at an age where if I was ever going to go into anything in private business, that was the time I had to do it. Also, I felt that I was becoming physically and mentally exhausted with the tremendous pressures that were on at that time and announced that I was not going to run for re-election. Toby Reynolds and uh, Bill Dyke were, I think there were others, but they were the two main candidates. And, and unfortunately, Toby lost the election to Bill Dyke, uh, who came on the scene as a very con ultra-conservative mayor. Let me back up to uh, when we switched from the city manager form to the mayor form mm -hmm. of government, a uh, mayor council. Uh, at that time, uh, George Forrester, who was a conservative Republican, was elected mayor. He was succeeded by Ivan Nestigan, a liberal Democrat, who was su succeeded by Henry Reynolds, a conservative Republican, mm -hmm. who was succeeded by a person I think was a liberal Democrat, Otto Feske, mm -hmm. succeeded by a real far right wing uh, conservative Republican, Bill Dyke who was then, later in 73, succeeded by a young man who not only called himself a liberal, but actually uh, pictured himself as a radical. Mm -hmm. A hippie mayor. Uh, and he was mayor for four years. Mm -hmm. uh, then for two terms, with Skornica and uh, Senzenbrenner, I think we might say we had a more middle-of-the-road mayor, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps leaning to the left, but... Uh, more centrist and uh, followed again by uh, Soglin, who today I think would say that he is a liberal and uh, may no still have some radical leanings, but is no longer picturing himself as a radical. That's so true. Madison has had an interesting history of flip-flopping back and forth politically. With the, from with the, mayor's, with the mayor's job, not with other jobs. So. No, as far as the courthouse is mm -hmm. concerned, yes, we did have uh, an elected district attorney, McMurray, who was only in office a short time before he died. Uh, he was elected as a Republican. Uh, we had have currently a Republican sheriff who's been re-elected mm -hmm. a couple of times. Uh, I don't think we can say that it's impossible for a Republican to be elected in Dane County. And uh, the voters are rather selective. They they look at the candidate. Yeah. If the Republicans better. They vote for him as they did for Sheriff, for instance. Again, I, I think, Ruth, if you and I both look back to 48, 50, 52, and on through the 50s, the Democratic Party was more unified. And we had a goal to elect people to public mm -hmm. office, and we worked together. While one candidate right. was campaigning, we were also campaigning for everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it was understood that if you had a primary, you had to win your primary first. We didn't get involved in the other person's primary, mm -hmm. so that when the primary was over with, we could organize and, and run together as a team. We had the uh, what was known as the Democratic Ticket Committee, uh, which I was chair. Uh, Keith Schwartz actually had organized it during the other two campaigns when mm -hmm. he was running. Uh, we pooled our resources. Uh, no, we did not get help from the Dane County Democratic Party in early years. As a matter of fact, we were asked to contribute to uh, the congressional candidate, who at that time was Horace Wilkie. We were asked to contribute to the gubernatorial candidate, Bill Proxmire. And it was only when Liesl Tarko became the chairperson of the Dane County Democratic Party that she said the goal of the Democratic Party in Dane County will be to provide resources for Dane County candidates first, mm -hmm. that we finally uh, received a nominal contribution for the courthouse candidates, also a nominal contribution for assembly candidates. I don't think you ever got anything from either the county or the state no. office when okay. you were running for the assembly yourself. It was something you financed your own. And I can remember Carl Thompson's first campaign for governor when the total spent, my husband was in charge, mm -hmm. $5,000 for the campaign, and he came very close to winning. I mean, yes, yeah, that was a... 1948. 1948. Of course, he had already run for Congress in a special election in the 1947. He almost won that one. 
Yes, he almost won that one. I think that was really the incentive when we said, when we come that close, we can do it. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, I know Marv Smith back and Miles Riley uh, had mentioned that during the 48 campaign, they filled the ticket. Uh, I don't remember. It's hard to get Democratic candidates. Yeah. Uh, they decided to get some young people, and Keith Schwartz was working at Oscar Meyer and said, sure, I'll run for county clerk. Miles Riley said, sure, I'll run for Register of mm -hmm. Deeds. Um, Remember Dr. Olson out in Stoughton? Dr. Olson in Stoughton ran for cor for coroner. And he retired before he did it. Did we have a candidate? Uh, well, Herman Curl was our mm -hmm, sure. sheriff candidate. Did we have anybody running for surveyor? I'm not sure. I think we did. Uh, clerk of court, uh, who did we have then? Was Hanson, Myrtle Hanson. Myrtle ran as a progressive, but yeah. as a Republican then. Yeah, and Gene Johnson. Well, Gene didn't run until 54. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, uh, it was when the West High School took its poll or mm -hmm. election before the election in November. and There weren't daily polls, that's one thing. We no, but things daily. looked pretty good for Democrats because on the west side of Madison. Because Truman carried them. Yeah, and uh, at that point they said, you know, it may be possible mm -hmm. we might win. I also remember hearing uh, Austin Johnson, who was county clerk, he was interviewed after the uh, September primary, and they asked him, uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to campaign? Or are you going to go fishing? And Austin said, oh, heck, I'm going to go fishing. We're, us Democrats can't beat us. Mm -hmm. And he and a number of others, including mm -hmm. Ed Wilkie, who later became mm -hmm. Judge Wilkie, uh, were rather surprised mm -hmm. that the Democratic Party won. It was Bob Arthur who ran for and was district elected district. for district attorney at that time. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, right. it became believable. I know. Didn't yeah. become believable to me. My mother was horrified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at that time there were three. There were you was a were you elected in the city or was the whole city? You were in the city of Madison, Herman Eisner in Western Dane and County, John and John Blaska, and John Blaska in West Eastern in Dane. Eastern Dane County, mm -hmm. who in 1950 in a primary election was interviewed. I remember that his picture by the tractor mm -hmm. in the, on the farm. And they ask him, uh, are you campaigning? Are you concerned about this young fellow, Proxmire, running against you for the assembly? And his statement was, everybody in Eastern Dane County. Of an interview with Mr. Otto Feske, the former county clerk, former mayor of Madison, former home secretary for Representative Kastenmeyer. The date is May 17, 1989. And, and I am Ruth Doyle. Mr. Feske retired last week at a, uh, uh, formally at a gala dinner party attended by several hundred people who paid him honor for their many years, for his many years of service to the Madison community. I'm testing on this tape to get it ready to get a tape ready for Otto Feske's interview, which will take place in just a little while. Okay, no, yeah. It was in 1950 that Bill Proxmire first ran for the assembly, and he may have done this elsewhere, but I know he went to Stoughton, took the telephone directory, and called every telephone number in the directory asking people to vote for Bill Proxmire for the assembly. He had infinite patience and no need to earn any money. He was no, he uh, and did door-to-door -door campaigning and uh, surprised dear old John Blaska, who was so sure he'd be uh, re-elected. Bill won the primary. Yeah, that and was the famous handshake. He, he introduced the handshaking campaign. Yes, that's, and that's right. Mm -hmm. And continued to do that on through 1988. Yeah when even though after he announced he was not running for re-election, I remember the day that he had made that announcement, a reporter asked him, Senator, are you going to continue to be at the county fairs, to be at the ball games and so on, to be out here shaking hands? He said, absolutely, a, a public official has to keep in contact with his constituency. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that he probably slacked off as the year went by, but uh, yeah. It was interesting that that is what kept Bill Proxmire in office all these years. Yeah, it really was. Everybody knew. 
Everybody knew him. I was just thinking today, what would have happened if Herb Cole had been a Republican and decided to be elected to the United States Senate against Bill Proxmire, would he, by expending the funds which he did, have been able to defeat Bill Proxmire? Or would the fact that Bill Proxmire had shook hands all those years, met millions of voters over those years, plus the fact that he got an awful lot of good publicity all during mm -hmm. the time that he was in public office, uh, would he have been able to have sustained it in I one re-election? I bet he couldn't have. It would have been really the supreme yeah. test of any candidate. Because now, this is a new phenomenon, the Herb Cole phenomenon, that you can buy an election is a new one. We're going to have to test it out several more times here. To be yes. Sure. And you know what surprised me about Herb Cole's election is that all that expenditure of money did not boomerang, where people said, wait a minute. This yeah. isn't the way people get elected to office. Yeah. Just because be. somebody can spend six million dollars of his own money. Out of his forty nine million dollar income in nineteen eighty. Yes, that, that was kind of interesting. Oh. But uh, any case too. I don't know if that if this is really good for our democratic process mm -hmm. that people can spend that kind of money. As you know, Bob Kastenmeyer has had an increasing cost of re-election. I remember in 1970, early 70s, when I was first with Bob Kastenmeyer, uh, we'd spend twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and say, boy, that was an expensive campaign. Yeah. In recent years, I think the most he spent was $425,000. Isn't that terrible? And there are congressional district elections where people have spent over a million dollars. It's a, it is a it's a distortion of the democratic process. It is. I'd like to think that someday people would wake up, but maybe they will. Maybe Herb Cole has jostled people, so next time around, they'll take that into account. Everybody talks about the need for reform. Mm -hmm. Everybody says something needs to be done. I'm not sure whether the Wisconsin system today, where if you spend or uh, have a certain dollar amount of contribution from a certain number of people, you can apply for uh, state funds is the answer. I think it has brought about a somewhat more sane campaign more here in equalized Wisconsin. It has to some extent equalized the opportunity of people, the incumbent and the challenger. I guess constitutionally you can't prevent people from spending their own money if they want to. Like yeah. Herb Cole, who can that's probably can help his opponent, but he can he can still yeah. spend as long as it's his own and the people know it's his own. Yeah. You can still spend what you want to, and does this then mean that only people who are independently wealthy can hold public office? Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things that you're working for Casimir all these many years since you left the mayor's office has um, kept his his name and his uh, constituents aware of Bob Kastenmeyer. He has not faded away from public view when he went to Washington to stay. He's a, he had a good staff here that kept kept him in the, informed about what's going on in this district and kept the district informed of what Bob was doing. Because he's not a firebrand and he's not an exciting speaker, he's not an electrifying candidate. He's just a steady, solid, hard-working copyright lawyer, as they say. Yeah, I think one day when Bob and I were driving, we were trying to say, well, what is the strong point of Gaylord Nelson, Bill Proxmire, and Bob Kastenmeyer? And uh, my observation at that point was Gaylord Nelson's strong point was his speaking ability. Mm -hmm. He could get up before an audience. Even in the early days, I remember when he was running for the Senate and when primarily when he was running for governor, he'd get up before a, one of our knife and fork clubs that were probably 90% Republican coming in and saying, I am not going to agree with what that Democrat is saying. But through telling his stories and getting getting the audience to, to laugh, mm -hmm. he had their attention and then very nicely could bring in what he wanted to talk about, and they'd walk away saying, you know, that fellow Nelson uh, makes a lot of sense. 
And Bill Proxmire is through the handshaking, plus the fact that in the earlier years in the Senate, he had a continual barrage of press releases mm -hmm. going out. And uh, of course, in the earlier years, it was possible for both Cast uh, well, Castmeyer and Nelson and Proxmire to use the videotapes, which they would mm -hmm. make in Washington. I know Bob would send them out here and I would take them to the television stations for Amen. the night news and then we'd take them, pick them up the next morning, send them back again to reuse for something else. Uh, Bob's strength, I think, was in the fact that people view him as a very fundamentally honest, decent person with a high degree of integrity who they may not always agree with but do feel comfortable with. Yes, they don't have to worry about him about his motives or his right. intentions. He's, you know. And if you look back to the early days of the Vietnam War when he tried to hold a meeting here in Madison, I was mayor at the time, uh, he asked for the use of uh, the council chambers. We then had, and I think we still have, a city county building commission that had ultimate control. Neither the mayor, the county board, or the county executive has authority to do anything about it. And the uh, City County Building Commission, uh, one of its members being Alderman Babe Rohr, said absolutely not. We're going to not let anything like that in, in our, in our city hall. <laughs> and so uh, the Methodist Church made mm -hmm. their facilities available. Yeah, it's my, hard to believe that that, that attitude did. Yeah, and did it. Bob weathered the storm at that mm -hmm. time. If you remember back in the uh, 60s, and particularly and even on into the 70s when uh, people running against him were painting him as a communist, as a red and un-American and whatnot. And the fact that he was trying to uh, do away with the Un-American Activities Committee, which caused all kinds of deviltry, yeah. uh, again was being used against him. In spite of all that, he had some very difficult races, but Bob Castamere was re-elected. Yeah. And for 30 years. Yes, if he and completing this term, he would have been in office 32 mm -hmm. years, and I expect that. Uh, and Bill Prox was in office. 30 over 31, I think, because yeah. Bill was elected in the summer or August, I believe, of 1957, and then immediately mm -hmm. re-elected in 58. So um, he wasn't in office a full uh, 32 years; it was 31, 31. years plus. So. That's a long career. By the end of this term, Bob will exceed that and have been in office mm -hmm. for 32 years in Washington. That, that seems so strange because he still seems like a, a young man to me, and you know, maybe I think of him always as he was when the first time he ran, uh, the, just out of law school and just a young, attractive, quiet-spoken fellow. And he hasn't changed much in those years. His no. hair is a little gray. His hair is bare. He's probably wiser. Mm -hmm. uh, he holds a very commanding chairmanship of a subcommittee on the Judiciary Committee that mm -hmm. uh, has uh, had before it over the years some very, very important legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, has supported uh, agriculture in each and every session, obviously, having a large constituency here but uh, has not been the person to come back home and say, had my bill been introduced, or because my bill was introduced, that's yeah, and so happened. Uh, he has let other people speak for him. And uh, again, I just this last campaign, <laughs> a person told me, I don't always agree with Bob Kastenmeier, but what I like about him is that he isn't always telling us what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He does it very quietly. So maybe there's some merit to the type of work. The quiet politician. So there you had 17 years of that. and now 17 years and four and months. And now in two minutes can you tell us what you're going to do? Well, when I announced in November that I was going to retire, I said that for the first three months I was going to be totally committed to be uncommitted to anything. Uh, since that time uh, I was persuaded to accept the chairmanship of the Second District Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have had some people express an interest in uh, uh, in some part-time work, and I'm evaluating that at this point. My inclination may be to just say no, because uh, 
prior to the time that I announced I was retiring, people would say, well, you could always get a part-time job. But I said, no, if I want to work, I'm going to work full-time. I'm happy with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And if I retire, I want to be retired full-time. So I'm not at all sure at this point that I will uh, accept any part-time. Living in employment. Madison provides all sorts of opportunities for volunteers yes. or part-time. And I have this feeling I've had it so strongly the last, just the last few months. I everybody. Everywhere I look, people are retired. Nobody seems to be working in, in Madison anymore. Mm -hmm. We're and at that age uh, yeah. where that happens, Ruth. And everybody, uh, and people that are still working have to kind of explain how come they're still working. Yeah. And with a new bill, why people will be retiring uh, much, much earlier at age 55 or, you know, somewhere mm -hmm. between there and 60. There will be thousands um, and thousands of people. Yeah. And what do they do? They will retire from their job and turn around and get another job. Get another job. Or they go and you see them in the hospitals, men working as volunteers. Oh, and, sure. And They're lots all... of interesting volunteer opportunity. Well, for many years I've said when this and this or the other thing occurs, I want to get back to uh, try to do something with my violin. And mm -hmm. it's one of the things I've said when I retire. I want to uh, see if I can, to some degree at least, recapture some of my yes. ability to play the violin. That'd be a nice I bit. have no intention of going out and on a concert tour <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, you can play for the barn dances. No, I wouldn't play for barn no. dances, but uh, if I could uh, recapture enough uh, technique and uh, reasonable intonation so that uh, maybe four of us could get together and play string mm -hmm. quartets, so I, uh, that is something I would like to do. Yeah, be fun, yeah. uh, there are many other things that I would uh, like to do as Madison well. Madison offers many opportunities. Yes. To choose. But uh, and I think we uh, we would and do enjoy uh, going to Arizona for a couple of months in the winter time. Yes. We enjoyed very much February and March uh, this year. Yes. And it was kind of nice just to be uh, free of everything and not to have to say, well, now tomorrow I have to do this, yes. that, and the other thing. And you don't uh, want to live like you won't want to live that way always. No, I you wouldn't know. want to be that free of everything. Uh, you have three children now. Yes, we. Where have, do they live? Uh, our son Michael uh, lives in Whitefish Bay. For many years, he was with Interna with Arthur Young, an international accounting firm. And about the time we thought that he was all set, never going to make any changes, he is now finance officer for a firm called Ameriquip that manufactures uh, old backhoes and more of the smaller type equipment, mm -hmm. uh, manufactures uh, items for uh, larger manufacturers. To, as he has a family? Uh, yes, uh, he and Doreen have uh, three children. Uh, the oldest daughter, Kate, is just completing her first year at Augustana College at uh, Rock Island, Illinois. Uh, she is more of the athletic type and interested in physical education. Uh, their next daughter, Christine, uh, is just finishing her first year uh, freshman at uh, uh, high school in Whitefish Bay. She and another girl uh, played uh, the Bach Double Violin Concerto for a mm -hmm. music festival and uh, went to the state. They got a second, not a first there at the state. However, the uh, small uh, chamber orchestra that they played in uh, got a first at the state. She's very interested in music and theater and so many things. One of these people that you wonder how in the world she can do it all in addition to getting probably straight A's in high school. Yeah. Uh, what will she continue in? Well, she has a great opportunity uh, at Whitefish Bay. They have perhaps the finest Yes. music program that I have heard or seen other than when Dick Church was the music teacher mm -hmm. at West High School here in Madison. Uh, she has been uh, working with the Florentine Opera, doing some children's bits there. She's, uh, she's been working with the Civic Rep Theater in Milwaukee. <laughs> I do think that people in, young people in that Milwaukee area do have opportunities that you don't even have here in Madison yes. and we're blessed with many opportunities. They have another daughter. Here. And the third is a son, Kurt, who, uh, well, I'm not sure, I think he's in sixth grade at this point, graduating from sixth grade, he's 12 years old, and also quite musical, but can't seem to settle down what he wants to do. He's no. played piano, he's played organ, he has a synthesizer, and uh, 
Uh, he doesn't have to decide at age 12. He can no, uh, he does have diabetes, uh, but uh, I think they are getting that under control. I'm hoping that someone of these days, all of a sudden, he'll say, well, dear, what I really want to do is play the piano or mm -hmm. the organ and, and get back to something beside the synthesizer or playing the drum in the band. Our oldest daughter, Susan, is uh, over at Wanakee. Her husband is math teacher, coach in Wanakee High School, uh, teaches computer science there. And uh, because the superintendent left to go to uh, uh, Sun Prairie, and the principal was moved up to uh, the superintendent's position. Uh, Dave has been the acting principal in the high school for several months. A wonderful opportunity for him to decide whether he wants to continue in administration or go back to being a full-time teacher. That decision has been made. Susie is uh, with the uh, First Wisconsin Bank in uh, Wanaki is now the supervisor of the tellers and also the bookkeeping operation that is in the bank in Wanaki. They're all part of the larger well, Wisconsin Corporation. Well, close by. They have uh, three children. The oldest, Bob, uh, is just finishing his junior year at the university and uh, decided to settle on uh, business uh, commerce as his. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, future and he was doing kind of floating around for a while decided to settle on that and we're rather happy that he continues at the university because he stays at our place when we go to Arizona this mm -hmm. other winter time uh, Jenny their oldest daughter or their yeah, their oldest their daughter because they have two sons uh, is graduating in a few days from Wanaki High School will be coming to the University of Wisconsin Probably going into social work is what she wants to do for the future. Uh, their son Greg is in uh, grade school, and I'm trying to think whether he's in third or fourth grade, uh, and really hasn't decided what his future might be, but uh, uh, I'm sure somewhere along the way he'll cast all, his lot with something They've too. all got their eyes on the wall. Undoubtedly we'll be going to the university. Our other daughter, uh, Cindy, is full-time mother, and uh, they're living near Deerfield. Her uh, husband, uh, John Regan, is with the uh, Data Processing Division of Health and Social Services for the state of Wisconsin, and designed the uh, program which makes it possible for all of the counties to have uh, a unified uh, system of keeping track of uh, delinquent fathers. So uh, I think that was probably one of his more commanding assignments since he's been with Health and Social Service. So everything, everybody's in good shape. Uh, yes, uh, Susie, uh, or Cindy is uh, a full-time mother. She does do some uh, assistance at the school in, uh, in Deerfield. Uh, her husband, John, has been on the school board uh, for several years, was uh, a winner of an election a couple of years ago who won by one vote and was re-elected to the uh, Board of Education there, uh, in addition to his work with the state. Their oldest son, uh, Zeke, is uh, I think in fifth or in sixth grade and very interested in sports of one kind or another. He also is taking piano lessons and trying to do some singing. Joe, who is uh, in the lower grades, uh, is always kind of an interesting young fellow. He, he and his mother came up to see me when I was in the National Mutual Benefit Building. They have two elevators. Uh, he and his younger sister, Erin, uh, got off the elevator with their mother. Uh, Joseph turned around and uh, there was an open door, so he stepped in and went down the elevator. When his mother noticed what happened, she was concerned. I ran down and found him standing at the, by the elevator downstairs with his outstretched arms for me to come pick him up. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, he wondered what had happened. Yeah. But uh, he is a good student, uh, but he's also one of these kids who you're never quite sure what's going to happen next. Yeah, which is interesting. And Aaron, uh, their youngest uh, child, their daughter, as a very lovable young girl who will be going into kindergarten this year. So you've got them in all ages and stages? All ages from kindergarten to uh, next year being a senior in university. Yeah, that's nice. 
Well, this has been a great pleasure, and I'm sure this conversation will be enjoyed by a number of people. Well, it's been wonderful. We've enjoyed our family, and again, it was one of the reasons that I said I was going to leave the mayor's office in 69. We still had Cindy home with us at that time, and I got to thinking if I want to enjoy having a child at home, I better uh, be, home for be home, and even then, uh, Cindy was in the university. So, uh, otherwise, my family would have grown away from me entirely while I was uh, doing such things as being county clerk and uh, mayor. Well, I have discovered that there's no substitute for a family, and I feel for the people that grow old that don't have children and grandchildren. I agree. They're a real That's blessing. They're more important than anything. And I could say we are very thankful and fortunate that uh, they've basically been healthy and uh, have... Productive. Productive good lives, yes. yes. Thanks very much, Anna. Okay.